Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, I'm super excited because just because we talk about investments all the time on this channel, doesn't mean we cannot have a lot of fun doing it. So my next guest today, if you're someone who has ever thought about taking an adventure, living uh, around the world, and turning that into a good investment at the same time by currency arbitrage, then you are definitely going to want to stick around for this interview. My guest today is Vance uh, from My Latin Life. We're going to cover topics like mac macro commentary. We're going to talk about the Latin life specifically, what, what has all the bros on Twitter dreaming about making the move across to Latin America. <laughs> we're going to take a virtual tour of Latin America. And we're going to, of course, talk about our return on investment segment. A quick disclaimer, guys, anything that you hear hear or see on uh, this channel is not to be considered uh, financial advice. It's just two guys having a chat that love investments, traveling and adventure. So make sure you seek the appropriate uh, financial advice before making any decisions. With that being said, I want to introduce Vance. Uh, how are you, my friend? Where are you and what's happening? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me tuning in from Portugal. I love it. And what I might do is uh, get you to give us a brief background on roughly who you are, where you come from, what got you into this uh, nomadic, nomadic adventurous lifestyle, and what you've been up to over the last two years, apart from inspiring envy of everyone who follows your Twitter account. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess there's my Latin life, and then there's me myself. The story behind My Latin Life, it's been around since 2014. Uh, it was started by another Canadian guy, and the blog was originally focused basically around dating in Latin America, talking about the differences between dating in different cities, different countries, and breaking that all down, and built up a pretty loyal fan base around that. Um, and then uh, I became friends with, with said Canadian guy, and... Uh, Basically, at the end of 2021, he wanted to make a change, and I ended up buying the blog off him, and I started taking it in a new direction where we're talking more about um, uh, taxes for digital nomads, second passports, acquiring second residencies and residency permits, things like that, sort of more advanced things, and taking my Latin life in the direction of being nomad capitalist for Latin America. I love it. And some of your services that you offer, um, give us a brief rundown on what those are. All of Vance's uh, and My Latin Life's uh, links will be in the description, guys, as per usual. And so if you like anything that you hear uh, today, please don't be shy to get in contact with him. Briefly, uh, let us know a little bit about your ideal client. Who comes to you for help? What do they generally ask? And how is it that you help them uh, achieve this amazing lifestyle that we, that we all follow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'll note first that uh, probably our main channel right now is Twitter, and you can catch us at My Latin Life on Twitter. Um, so that's just one word, My Latin Life. So we have the Twitter, we have a podcast as well, the My Latin Life podcast, where we have guests, esteemed guests, much like yourself. And so you can catch us for free on those two channels for basically tons of free knowledge. Our blog as well, mylatinlife.com. Uh, hundreds of articles uh, talking a little bit about dating, but then, I'll, you know, a lot about just sort of lifestyle and everything in Latin America, hundreds of city guides to every, basically every city in Latin America, where to stay, what to do, what are the best bars, things like that. So tons of free, free intel out there to, for everyone to get their beak wet. Um, in terms of paid services, um, you know, there's, there's ways to get in contact with me. I have a Calendly um, and we have more, uh, advanced services that are going to be coming down the pipeline, kind of like trying to create sort of like an immigration agency, have a, have a bunch of cool ideas, but literally lately just been building up all the sort of, you know, give before you get type stuff and, and building, you know, building up the audience. Absolutely. Uh, the fountain of knowledge uh, is on Twitter. So make sure you get in contact uh, with those guys. I'd like to get your thoughts on some things. So here, here's just what I'm seeing, and I might live in my own little uh, bubble. What are some trends that you're seeing with regards to offshore living? I'm seeing a heap of North Americans starting to wake up to this concept of moving abroad. And it's not always Latin America, but Latin America seems to be a very hot topic. 
What's the number one trend you're seeing in terms of people that want to make the move out of, say, Western Europe and North America? Who are these people? Where are they going? And what's driving them uh, to make those decisions? Yeah, I think everything falls into a larger sort of macro trend or super cycle of geo arbitrage. Uh, this really got popularized by Tim Ferriss in the four hour work week when, when that was published back in 2007, I want to say. Um, so people have been aware of this for a long time, but I think remote work has made this much more possible in recent years. Um, I think remote work really started taking hold, I don't know, maybe around 2016, something like that, where it became really available to the masses. But then with, uh, with what happened in 2020, that really sort of blew the gates open and really released remote work to, to a lot of people. And people said, you know, why am I paying for this expensive apartment in Sydney or in New York or in London? Why am I paying $3,000 a month when I can just go live on the beach in Mexico or another uh, beautiful tropical location? Maybe for you guys, it's Bali. And so uh, I think geo arbitrage is a big part of it and being able to basically just reduce your expenses and uh, live a better life for half the price. It's certainly uh, a layup in terms of return on investment. I mean, if you can be earning hard currency and then reduce your expenses, I mean, it, as you say, with that ability to keep your income going while you're working abroad, mm -hmm. uh, it's an absolute game changer. So really, uh, I'm so curious about Latin America. I've been to the US many, many times. I haven't made it across the border yet. Uh, that's going to change as of January. But what is it about the Latin life uh, that draws people there? Is it mainly men they get in contact with you, like the, the bros on Twitter, or do women want to go down there as well? What is it particularly about Latin America that you think is most attractive for, for the average person? I think it's going to be slightly different for different people. Um, but I think uh, it sort of depends where you are in your life. But I think, like we said, the lower cost of living is huge. I think the better weather is huge, especially for uh, Canadians and maybe people in the UK. Um, I think uh, dating opportunities is a big part of it. I think um, outdoor activities like surfing and things like that is a big part of it. I think um, re really also just like the mindset and mentality of the people, it really feels like you're going back in time, maybe 30, 40 years, just in terms of sort of mindset and approach to life. It's much more traditional. Uh, it's more Catholic. And, um, uh, you know, people are more just more friendly. And um, yeah, it's just a very sort of different mentality. And for some people, it's really refreshing to sort of get away from the wokeness and stuff. And just to get back to a place that, you know, kids are still out playing in the streets, and they're not addicted to iPads. Yeah, that's huge. And it's funny you say that, that some of the Latino community here uh, in Australia, which is not a big community, but it's... It you know, you're talking to these people, it's like they're, they're actually seeing you and you're having a conversation with another human as opposed to having uh, a conversation with another human through a, a device. So I can certainly appreciate that. When you say it's a more traditional uh, vibe, what do you mean by that? Give us some examples. Yeah, it's a little bit nebulous uh, in terms of examples, but um, you know, it's a, it's a, a region that still is sort of tied to um, formality and the Catholicism and sort of the um, things that were taught by sort of, I guess, Portugal and Spain hundreds of years ago. And, you know, it's the type of place where um, uh, <laughs> maybe you have to ask the parents uh, for the, to be able to date the daughter or, um, or there's just like more rules and uh, more rules around sort of customs and uh, they, they've sort of kept a lot of those traditions that, you know, used to be common in the States back in the 1950s and 60s and everything. And, uh, you know, where, you know, the woman does the the cooking and the cleaning. Um, I have a, a girlfriend right now. And b before she met me, she had like basically never seen a guy cook before. And then uh, and she, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I like cooking, so I don't mind it. But yeah, uh, you know, so there, there's so many examples. It's hard to uh, I, I might need more more coffee or, or or more booze actually to give you some of the juicy examples, but I think people directionally know what I'm saying. Yeah, so they've been able to maintain that, I guess, uh, that cultural core, and I think that's something that's we're starting to pay the price of letting that go here in the the developed world, in, in inverted commas, where you know I think people are 
are sick of this this wokeism and degradation of society and it's ironic that people that you know they were so against this um traditional value system and now we see the floodgates almost opening where people are wanting to to go back to that so it's it's very interesting how would you say what would be the main differences culturally between that sort of north american to so us canadian and then central and south american cultures what, what are some of the pros and some of the cons would you say from your experience at least yeah culturally um yeah i think the people that are like i think i think you can't paint the whole continent or two continents with one brush because you're talking okay. about nearly 20 countries you're talking about over 500 million people um so it's it's very big and there's there's certainly differences between brazil and mexico and all these places but they're just very fun like it's just extremely fun a lot of adventure uh they they like to dance and party and sing and um everyone's a good dancer singer musician and uh there's just really just like a lot more life in the streets a lot more uh like going out at night is much more fun as well uh so it's it's just like a more fun place to be and really good nature and lots of stuff to do. Okay. So you're telling me that I need to learn how to sing. I need to learn how to dance and I need to be able to ask a girl's dad for permission to take her out. Uh, you're going to, you're <laughs> going to, you're going to teach me all this, right? Like you're going to give me the, you're going to give me a, a six week boot camp to, to get me in shape before I hit up. the. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, it, it, it's it's tough because I, I don't want to have too too much of that content because I don't want to get canceled and I want to run sort of like a clean brand. But it definitely it definitely is a part of it. So it's it's tough for me to know where to draw the line and everything like that. But um, let's just say like going out at night in Latin America and going out at night in Canada are two very different things, uh, and uh, it's much more fun in Latin America. Oh well, well, I've I've had some good nights in Canada, so uh, that that's a that's a high bar that's a high bar to to cross. I want to transition <laughs> into some topical news that has been blowing up on Twitter. Paraguay changing its uh, PR rules as of I believe two days ago, so very recent. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's happened there and what the hell is going on with Airbnb prices uh, at the moment. Yeah. Um, so Paraguay, uh, this is a country that I know quite well. I've spent time there. Uh, I've done the residency program there. And, and it's it's a really a great place. I know for anyone just hearing about Paraguay, it might sound very random. Uh, and, and it certainly is an off the beaten path place, but uh, it's it's a lovely place and I'm happy to go into more detail. They are currently pausing residency applications. Um, basically, historically, it's been very, very, very easy to get residency in Paraguay, basically one of the easiest places in the world, um, where you can just deposit about $5,000 in a bank in Paraguay, and, you know, come away with a, a residency permit and tax residency as well. And so I remember the first time I went down to Paraguay, um, a number of years ago, one of the first dudes I met was an Australian guy, and he was working online. Uh, but he had been traveling the world for many years. He was in Colombia. He was here. He was there. Um, and he he was like, why am I still paying tax to Australia? Um, I haven't lived there for like five years now. You know what I mean? And so he went to Paraguay. He put the money in the bank. He got his tax residency. And he basically was able to you know, reduce his tax rate from whatever it is in Australia to basically zero. And uh, didn't have to give the queen any more money. And uh, so it, it really works for, for a lot of people. Um, so hopefully that's a relatable example for your audience. Uh, so it's currently on hold. It's going to restart up again eventually. Um, it just might take a slightly different form. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely have eyes peeled uh, as to any potential changes that will come about uh, due to that. Airbnb used to be so good, used to be so reliable, I'm seeing some of the the prices being put up, not only by yourself, but other people on Twitter. Uh, what's going on with Airbnb prices? Because it's got to be more than just the general inflation that the world's experiencing, right? What, what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, part of it's probably the regulation um, in terms of, you know, regulation has increased, uh, you know, that's been that's been laid down by the municipalities and governments and stuff like that. And just so maybe that's sort of constricting supply to some extent. 
Um, I think we're seeing not just an Airbnb, but we're seeing rent prices around the world rising a lot. I think um, even back in the States and in Canada, rent has basically doubled in the past two years. Um, it, so it's uh, it's not just an Airbnb thing. It's just getting much more expensive to find accommodation. And um, yeah, I think Airbnb has kind of been, I think people have had these complaints about Airbnb for a long time now. And Airbnb has just been very slow to react. And I guess so we're just going to have to see how they react because I think no one uh, likes all these fees and everything. No, absolutely. hundred percent not. Have you seen any viable alternatives to Airbnb? Because I can't really think of any at the moment. You know, when I think about going somewhere, I just go, okay, Airbnb, I'm going to get a look at the area and it's my sort of once one-stop shop. Are there any decent competitors which you've come across that might be worth a look? really the only competitor is Facebook groups. Um, obviously that comes with a lot less sort of security and it, it's not the best fit for people. It's more of a time investment, but if you want to get a really good deal, it's gotta be a Facebook group. Um, I think historically when I travel, I try to spend at least one month per country, uh, or one month per city, and then basically getting a monthly discount on, on Airbnb. And then what you do is you reach out to the hosts and you ask for a special discount, and um, you basically just reach out to like 10 hosts, you ask them all for a discount, and then you sort of weigh your options for a one month Airbnb based on who gives you the best discount and what's the best sort of package overall. Because what I find is, uh, if you rented a place for say two weeks, and it was, you know, 100 bucks a night, more or less, that would make it about 1500 bucks. But if you do a monthly Airbnb, it's basically going to be around that same price as well, because it set, it changes the frame of the conversation from a nightly rate frame to a monthly rate frame. And then they start looking and seeing, okay, 1500 bucks a month, that's actually much more than the whatever the going rate. Um, and so if you're going to stay somewhere for two weeks, you might as well just stay there for a month. That's a good tip. And that's certainly consistent with uh, what I have seen. In terms of uh, Latin America, let's break it down. Let's really uh, go on a virtual tour, if you will, uh, to all the lads listening. Uh, why don't we start off with uh, Mexico? I want you to give us uh, maybe a two minute overview, what you like, what you don't like, best places you've been, and a, a general overview as to your thoughts on Mexico. Yeah, Mexico is a, a big, uh, very culturally diverse place. It's very difficult to review in two minutes. But I would say there's sort of like maybe three main regions that uh, digital nomads and expats are going to. The number one hotspot would be the, the Yucatan Peninsula, where you have Playa del Carmen, Cancun, Tulum, right? And that's sort of more of a, a seasonal place where it's sort of best between um, basically in the wintertime because uh, the summer gets very humid. Uh, so that's the, the Yucatan Peninsula, lots of partying, really good beaches, good swimming. Uh, the other two main regions would be sort of the West Coast, the Pacific Coast, which would be uh, Vallarta, Mazatlan, Acapulco, Manzanillo, places like that. Uh, beautiful sunsets, beautiful surfing, uh, sort of more Mediterranean style climate. Um, and then the third region would be basically like the center of Mexico, where the majority of the population is. Uh, which would be Mexico City, it would be Guanajuato, Querétaro, uh, Puebla, and just a lot of big cities, a lot of cities with like half a million million people that you're that you're probably unfamiliar with unless you you know a lot about Mexico. But if you're a city person, there's lots of cities in the middle. It's not just Mexico City. Um, so those are kind of the regions. You know, you have two coastlines, or or even you know even more coastlines if you can if you consider the Baja Peninsula and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, Mexico is very regionally diverse, different climates, different types of people, different cultures. So really a lot to explore in one country. It's a huge country. Absolutely. And infrastructure wise, does it vary uh, much between those top three picks? I mean, can a digital nomad get good internet anywhere? Do you have to have a decent level of Spanish? What would you say uh, with regards to those two questions? Because I know they're very common questions that people have. Yeah, I'd say the internet is pretty much good everywhere except small beach towns. Um, so there's like places like uh, Puerto Escondido and Sayulita, sort of famous surfer beach towns where the internet's not great. But any like city city is going to have perfectly fine internet. Uh, so that shouldn't be an issue. 
Uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, do you need to have decent Spanish uh, for all the gringos oh, out there that are dreading uh, opening their mouths and hablando español? <laughs> um, I think that's part of the adventure and that's part of the like personal development that you're going to go through 100%. is learning Spanish. I think that's a lot of the draw for it. Uh, draw for a lot of people is the ability to learn a new skill, the very important skill of learning Spanish. Uh, one of the you know most spoken languages in the world. Mexico obviously has quite good English, bordering the United States, culturally much closer to the United States than maybe some of the other countries uh, in Latin America. So you'll be able to get by fine, and you'll obviously have a much more enriching experience uh, as your Spanish gets better. 100%. And do you recommend online? Do you recommend in-person lessons? Do you recommend... Uh going out meeting girls great way to meet uh learn a new language what's your favorite way of uh, learning a new language yeah i had a tweet which was uh how to learn spanish without actually talking to anyone <laughs> and so uh if you don't want to talk to anyone then you can listen to podcasts you can read the newspaper uh you can use duolingo you can do a couple different things and so i use podcasts a lot uh, sort of there, there's lots of podcasts that are sort of built for language learners. And so when I'm in the gym, when I'm walking, whatever, I'm listening to at least an hour of Spanish and an hour of Portuguese every single day. Uh, even now, like years later, where I'm conversational and stuff. So I, I'm always listening to Spanish. And I think listening is the number one skill. Um, but in terms of, you know, actually talking to people or in person lessons, I think what I what I found, uh, uh, and this isn't 100% politically correct, but what I found was, you know, uh, an in-person lesson with a real professor might cost you 10, 15, 20, $30 an hour. Or if you just go on dates, the date's going to cost less than that because it's just going to be the cost of a couple beers, which are like a dollar a beer in Mexico. So um, a, date, a date is actually cheaper than a, a formal language lesson. And uh and uh, potentially more fun. So uh, that's that's one way to learn Spanish. Just make sure there's no alimony costs uh, associated with the after the date. But anyway, that's a subject for yeah. another so day. So there's your ROI. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there it is. That's genius. That's why he is who he is. So moving through Central America, there's heaps uh, of differences between those little countries. But maybe we touch on the two most popular, would you say, Costa Rica and Panama? To tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about those. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Costa Rica is surprisingly expensive, uh, basically the most expensive country in Central America and probably all of Latin America. Um, it's sort of a Disneyified version of Latin America because uh, there's just a lot, a lot of gringos um, and uh, it's been historically been like the number one spot for vacations and for retirees and everything like that, even in like the early 2000s. I think uh, Costa Rica has actually arguably gone down in popularity, but in like the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, sort of before remote work, Costa Rica was sort of considered the, the number one spot. Um, and so they're, they're very used to sort of like the tourism industry and everything like that. So it's not... Um, like it's it it's not as much of like a gritty adventure. It's it's much more sort of seamless. So uh, Co Costa Rica is uh, so that's Costa Rica, mm -hmm. um, and then Panama. Uh, Panama pe people have sort of like a love hate relationship with it. Some people like it, some people hate it. Um, I personally love it a lot, but you got to get into the local culture. Panama is where reggaeton uh, started. Um, it's uh, been taken over. Reggaeton's been taken over by Puerto Rico and Colombia, but it was really started in Panama. Interesting. And so uh, they have uh, like I don't know. It's just a it's just a great place with uh, like lots of kind of music and sort of like Caribbean vibes. People and everyone's sort of like living breezy. Um, Panama is a very very like interesting place from a nature perspective. You know, being sort of on this sort of isthmus between North and South America. Uh, you have the, you know, the, the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, barely 50 kilometers from each other, and uh, basically like a huge mountain range in between. So there's tons of waterfalls and just like really insane nature, uh, coffee plantations, stuff like that. Lots of different areas to explore within Panama, everything from sort of mountain towns to 
you know, more, more beach towns and stuff like that. Uh, cheaper than Costa Rica uses the U S dollar. Um, obviously very tax friendly as well. Uh, so I, uh, I'm a big fan of Panama and whenever I hear people are, are asking me about Costa Rica, I typically tell them to go to Nicaragua or Panama instead. Okay. Top tip and the differences between Panama city, other places like Bocas de Toro and, uh, Chiriqui, uh, any particular things to see in those places? I know Boca de Toro is very uh, popular with Canadians apparently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we, we have city guides on our website, like I said, and uh, so we have city guides to most of these cities in Panama. So uh, go and check that out. Uh, Bocas del Toro is a pretty cool place. Um, it's sort of like a, a bunch of little islands and that are, you, you basically have to take a, a boat to get around. So you just sort of like pull up to the uh, pull up to the waterfront and there are these guys sitting waiting in boats and you just pay them a couple of dollars and they'll boat you over to the next island and you can go get lunch on the other island and come back and or go to the beach and whatever um, the, the internet's getting better there's a Selena hotel there's lots of sort of digital nomads uh, spending time there uh, big surf spot big spot for for diving and and different water sports and stuff like that. So pretty cool spot, Boca del Toro, not really somewhere you'd want to spend long-term, but it's pretty unique and uh, definitely worth a visit for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, in terms of the other places, I mean, uh, Panama definitely has a lot of different spots. Um, Panama City is, uh, I think, makes up like more than half the population of the country. Panama is really small, like it's less than 5 million people, I think, of which, you know, more than 2 million people are in Panama City. Um, and it's uh, it's a pretty cool city. I mean, it's a good place for uh, to go out, a uh, good place with a lot of culture and stuff like that. Uh, one of the most sort of developed places in Central America. It's got some of the most, uh, like the highest buildings in all of Latin America, like tons of like 50 story buildings and stuff like that. You can rent a, like, like a pretty dope oceanfront condo for very cheap and, and post up there and stuff like that. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I always have a good time when I'm in Panama City. I love it. Can't wait to experience it. All right, moving on to one of the most popular, the heavy hitters, Colombia top uh, two to three cities give us an overview on colombia yeah colombia um definitely a lot to say about colombia as well i think it's you know one of the most popular countries for digital nomads and uh first-time travelers so i think for most first-time travelers in latin america they're either going to go to mexico or colombia there's tons of direct flights to colombia from the u.s and and other spots um it's a place that uh, you could sort of divide it into two regions. There's the coastal region and then there's the mountain region. So the coast is um, Santa Marta, Barranquilla and uh, Cartagena. And then the mountains is everything else, you know, Cali, Medi and Bogota. I love it so much to experience biodiversity. Let's switch gears and start speaking Portuguese. Let's move over to Brazil. Uh, sleeping mm -hmm. giant, in my opinion, something like eighth biggest uh, economy in the world, uh, seventh most popularly spoken language, something like that. Talk to me about Brazil, a humongous country, obviously, maybe divided up north, south, major cities, different vibes, uh, and your experiences with Brazil. Yeah, Brazil is absolutely enormous. I think people don't really understand the scale of how gigantic Brazil is. And, uh, you know, it, officially, it's only one country, but it's really a lot of different countries in there, um, with a lot of regional variation and a lot of rich culture, the north and the south are very, very different. The south is much more developed, uh, educated European, and then the north in some places is like as poor as Africa and, and, and just like crazy. <laughs> um, so it's a very, very crazy place. I mean, the whole thing is like a amazing beach line from North to South though. And so it's just like one continuous gigantic beach the entire way for like thousands of kilometers. Uh, and so it, as you can imagine, the nature is just amazing. It's just a very tropical, amazing country. I think for a lot of people, it's really like the final frontier of Latin America. And it's a place that you could basically get get lost in and, and have fun forever. Uh, the people are awesome. It's extremely fun. It's uh, it's really an amazing place. I think most people that go never want to leave. Um, and 
yeah, it's a, uh, it's really its own beast uh, that, that almost needs to be treated separately from the rest of Latin America. Wow. Very, very interesting. Give me a city from the North and a city from the South and give me some commentary. Um, yeah, I think like the biggest or top city in the North would be Fortaleza. Um, it's, uh, one of the population wise, one of the largest cities in the North, uh, you know, I think it's over 3 million people and known as sort of like the party capital as well. Um, and they have direct flights to Miami and, and different places, but typically like Northern Brazil can be hard to get to from outside, uh, from outside Brazil. But, uh, yeah, Fortaleza is a, probably a good spot to start in the North, uh, in the South. Um, I mean, you have Rio, you have Sao Paulo, you have Florianopolis, lots of different spots. Um, yeah, I think uh, probably the number one digital nomad or or uh, international spot would be Florianopolis, which is sort of like this island archipelago uh, with, uh, you know, tons of surfing and all that type of stuff. I hope you're taking notes, guys. You're getting the combination of years of experience. Okay, we've got a lot to cover, but let's uh, wrap up our tour today with Argentina, which seems to be making the news for all the wrong reasons. And then perhaps we can uh, twist Vance's arm to come back for another discussion and we can cover some of the more obscure places that we may have missed. Tell me about Argentina. Yeah, Argentina. I mean, uh, it's a place that seems to be changing a lot right now. And uh, it's it's tough to say, but um, basically, if, if you can uh, do what we're doing, the geo arbitrage, if you can show up with US dollars, uh, you're going to be able to exchange your dollars at a uh, what's called the blue rate, which is a, basically like a black market rate where you're going to get basically double the official rate. I think the official rate might be at like 120, 140 or something like that right now. And uh, you're going to get double that uh, with your U.S. dollars if you show up. So Argentina, you know, it's a place with great steak, great wine. You can go to a restaurant, spend less than $10 and get like a fat, amazing, best steak of your life, you know, full bottle of wine. So it's just dirt cheap, but still has, uh, still feels very European, reasonably safe, good infrastructure um you know lots of cool architecture and stuff like that has lots of cool like italian influences they have espresso uh, cafe shops on every corner and stuff like that so it can feel very familiar and and very doable but sort of because of the economic situation um there's definitely a lot of like weird inconveniences like you'll order an uber and then they'll sort of like message you and say i won't pick you up unless you pay cash do you have cash <laughs> Even though you're already you're already like paying card, uh, you go to the ATM and there'll be like a thirty dollar limit, and it costs like nine dollars for the ATM fee. Uh, so just like lots of sort of like weird economic stuff. But if you can get past that, there's a um, there's a there's a lot of value to be had because most people aren't willing to deal with those little stressors. But if you can get past that, then you have a really cheap country that's relatively safe and can basically be your playground so as long as you can get the currency situation under control you've got fine dining beautiful architecture uh, and all other things that uh, certainly make uh, me salivate as you're talking about the steak now i got a buddy uh, who's in argentina at the moment and he tells me best looking girls he's seen in latin america true or false yeah that's probably true Wow. Okay. Now that's a, that's saying something. Uh, all right, guys, it's time to switch to our ROI segment. And this is where we uh, can really get into the weeds in terms of the numbers. Uh, I would love to know what your highest ROI has been and give us a little bit of a rundown. If it's a financial investment, maybe give us the numbers. If it's an action or activity that you've taken, give us a little bit of a backstory and explanation as to what you did and how it paid off for you. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of ways I could answer this question, but um, I'll give you one, which would be earning primarily in U.S. dollars. Uh, the U.S. dollar has really outperformed uh, a lot of currencies, including the Australian dollar, including the Canadian dollar in recent years. And so the choice to basically primarily earn in U.S. dollars uh, has been has been really, really big. 
Uh, I was born in Canada, you know, I'm a Commonwealth guy like yourself. And if I had basically chosen to follow the traditional path that was set out for me, I would be earning Canadian dollars, like all of my high school buddies. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would have had, I would have seen, you know, the value of my money fall against the US dollar quite a lot. So for better or worse, the US dollar is still seen as a safe haven. It's still sort of the, you know, the, the, the model currency, uh, at least for the, the near future. And so the extent that you can uh, sort of diversify into the US dollar, or at very least diversify into multiple currencies and sort of have a, uh, you know, be able to manage your risk that way. Uh, I think that's a great thing to do. Very wise words, guys, not just about diversifying in assets, but uh, currencies or the instruments of measurement. Uh, and it's easy to forget. So very wise words, indeed. Is there a particular region, like one, uh, one country that sticks out as financially best situated to profit from what we're seeing in terms of the deglobalization themes into the future? Is there any that, that come to mind or one particular uh, country that comes to mind? Um, I think one thing we definitely want to talk about in this episode is uh, territorial tax systems. Mm. Um, so for people who are unfamiliar with this, uh, there's sort of a couple different sort of tax systems in the world. There's residency-based taxation and there's territory-based taxation. And so these are sort of your, your classic sort of tax havens and, and places where um, you're only going to be taxed on the money that you generate within the country and any uh, any money that you generate offshore is not going to be taxed. And so Canada, Australia, the UK, uh, Europe, these are residency-based taxation countries. And if you're a resident of these countries, you're taxed on your worldwide income. Um, but if you're able to switch your tax residency to a territorial tax country, then um, you're basically going to be able to earn money offshore and not have to pay tax on it. Now, that might sound a little gray, it might sound a little scary, but I assure you that people have been doing it for years and it's totally, totally normal. And one of the big draws of Latin America is that Latin America has so many of these territorial tax countries where you can go in, you can get tax residency, you can get set up, and then you can sort of basically like take a piece of paper to Australia and say, hey, Australia, um, I'm not an Australian tax residency anymore. I'm now a, a Paraguayan tax residency. I'm now a Panamanian tax resident. I'm not going to file taxes in Australia anymore. And you can basically leave that tax net of that legacy high tax country. And you can basically get set up in Latin America and enjoy a lot more personal freedom. Provided that you don't then re-qualify uh, in your original home country via staying for more than 183 days or having too many economic ties. So make sure you do it properly, guys. Get in touch with uh, someone like Vance who can make sure uh, you set up your affairs in order so that you don't get into any trouble. But you can... Uh, basically take advantage of all that the world has to offer just by uh, thinking differently and getting someone to help you with your setting up uh, in a creative fashion uh, offshore. Well, mate, thank you so much uh, for an epic conversation. I'd love to get uh, you back on in a couple of months. We can talk about anything that we may have missed. Is there anything else you'd like to say or is there anything that I've missed that you think we should cover before we uh, wrap up this episode? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I'd love to, I don't know if you talk about this uh, in this conversation, but I'd love to hear a little bit about what your plan is. And uh, uh, I think you said that you, you're looking to do something similar to what we've been talking about. And uh, would love to would love to hear about it briefly. Okay, uh, certainly. So uh, I think for me, uh, since COVID, so I uh, had a business in Melbourne, physical location, you know, traditional um, service business, um, started it, bought some other businesses, rolled them up, and then was right on the point of selling them in uh, March of 2020. And so everything went through, was under contract, but that didn't mean I had any issues with uh, the sales process. Uh, and of course, after that, I I'd achieved everything I wanted to achieve. And I had this epic trip planned. Uh, my girlfriend and I were going to go to Europe uh, for the Euro 2020. And obviously COVID came and just destroyed all of that. So uh, I 
never want to be in a situation again where I am the de facto property of one particular government only. And so when COVID came around, I really started to 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 re-examine my life and I had plenty of spare time. I'd sold my business and I was locked down. I couldn't leave the house literally for, mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. And that's when I started to uh, educate myself more on the ability to um, to structure different uh, corporate structures overseas perhaps or to to move uh, to a warmer climate perhaps. Um, and it's where I came across uh, your Twitter and, and various other uh, gentlemen in this particular space. And so for me at the moment, I would love to be able to set up some plan Bs, at least have a flag in every continent. And so what I mean by that um, to people that might not be familiar with the term is obviously uh, I spent a lot of my life in Australia. I have uh, an Italian citizenship in the process. So that would potentially be a flag nice. in Australia and a flag in Europe because of, uh, Italy being in the EU, <laughs> at least for now, I mean, that, that may change the way that the politics are going at the moment, um, but potentially that would give me access to anywhere in the Eurozone. And then obviously Latin America is just um, another way for me to get a flag on the continent of the Americas, but also because I really want to go there. And so I'm at the stage now where I have physical business, but I also have uh, digital businesses. And so the ability that, that you've certainly taught me a lot about is to say, well, hey, if your income is not geographically defined, what's a, what's a more intelligent approach? Can you set up a, a specific corporate structure in one of the territorial tax jurisdictions that you mentioned and um, just have a, a smarter way of saving yourself? In my case, it's, it's basically paying myself to go on a big holiday. And that sounds strange yeah. to people, but... That's what it is. I mean, if I look at what it will be costing me to stay in Australia sure. uh, purely through taxes, let alone living expenses, I'm going to be paying myself a lot of money by, by taking all yeah. of it. So yeah, I think there's I think there's a couple different paradigm shifts that occur. I think one of the paradigm shifts is that uh, when you start internationalizing, you switch from a frame of uh, you switch basically to a frame where you become sort of like a shopper of countries or, and you be, you mm. put yourself in the buyer's seat. That's a Whereas, bef and so, bef you know, if you're a person where, you know, you only have one citizenship, uh, all your money comes from that one country, like you're basically selling yourself to that country. Um, and, and once you, you start making money online and you start getting multiple residencies and multiple passports, the whole dynamic flips on its head the where now you're in the, in the buyer's seat and now you're in sort of a position of power where you're set where you can say hmm like what does this country have to offer me and uh it really ch completely changes the power dynamic and then yeah what you're saying around um basically getting paid to go on vacation is true uh you know i, I some of my most popular tweets are where i say you know what, what if I said I'd pay you $20,000 a year to stay out of Canada for more than six months? Would you do it, right? And people would do it. It's like, what, what if I paid you $20,000 a year? What if I paid you $2,000 a month just to stay out of Australia? Would you do it? And a lot of people would say yes. And it doesn't mean you can never go home, but it might mean that you might want to spend less than six months a year. Exactly. And so... And so, uh, especially for Canadians, it's just, it, it just became very, very obvious. It's just like visit in the summer, skip winter, and uh, you're going to be able to save tens of thousands of dollars a year. And if, you know, you start being a big boy and, and start making millions of dollars, you know, it just becomes exponentially larger, uh, the savings. So you said you're uh, trying to get Italian citizenship? Uh, yes, indeed. So that's through my ancestry. And mm -hmm. so uh, we filed for that. And so, yeah, obviously, anytime you can um, you can get citizenship via your uh, ancestry yeah, by descent, yeah, by descent, it's a it's a no brainer. You should definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with the Italian program, uh, and there's a very very little known program, uh, basically connecting Italy and Panama. Are you familiar with this program? I am. Yes, it's a it's a quirky little loophole. Yeah. Yeah, and so the Panama recently changed their rules regarding the friendly nation.
visa uh, and they made it a little bit harder to get into Panama, made it so that you had to actually like invest, uh, buy a house or whatever. But I believe the Italy Panama friendship treaty is still in place yes, and you can is. still get into Panama uh, under the old rules where you basically just like spin up a company and put like 5,000 bucks into it, something like that. So I believe that's still active. The last that I heard, um, and, uh, very little known uh, sort of quirky program or option. And uh, so if you have the chance to basically just wait till that Italian passport's in your hand and then apply to Panama, uh, uh, that's going to be a really good way to go. It's actually cheap. There's cheaper fees too, as well for yeah. the, for the Italians. Yeah. yeah. M my lawyer has, uh, has made me aware of that, which is obviously handy. And I think that speaks to so much of what you talk about is that, look, you can never have too many options. And so you never know where um, each time you get a different PR or you get a different passport, it, it opens up the world to you. And all of a sudden you're a global citizen and not just the de facto property of your country of birth. And I certainly don't want to be in a position again where I'm locked down and I, I have no ability to, to, to have any freedom of, of moving around. And whereas if I had have had this organized before the pandemic, and obviously, uh, you know, I didn't predict the pandemic, but having these options would be able to set me up to have the ability to go somewhere that may have had a, a less stringent lockdown, let's say, or it may just, exactly. give, it may just give me the ability to go somewhere where people are a little bit more philosophically aligned with myself, um, for instance. So, yeah, I think it's mm -hmm. I think it's super important to have all the options um, that you can get. Yeah, I'll give I'll give you uh, Benjamin one last sort of paradigm shift or or trend that I think is uh, uh, basically occurred in the past 10, 20 years. Um, obviously, the idea of being an expat or or an immigrant has always been around, but people traditionally they would only expatriate or immigrate to one country at a time, and so. Uh, you know, maybe you're Italian and then you immigrate to Australia. And so you're only getting one new citizenship or permanent residency, probably in your lifetime. But what we're seeing now, basically with, you know, international travel and, you know, obviously uh, planes and, and the internet and things like that, and really just in the past, like five, 10 years, is people are seeing, I can actually have multiple residencies at the same time I, and so there's like sort of this new class of people that have emerged typically digital nomads or people who make money online and they basically just travel the world flying around setting up different residency permits all over the planet uh, and and they're basically juggling some people like five plus permanent residencies and all of these permanent residencies uh, some of them are, some of them you're, they're using more actively. Some of them are more of like a plan B or a backup, but it's just good to sort of have a, a toe in different countries. And as a permanent resident, the, the clock is basically typically ticking towards citizenship as well. And so it might take three, five years as a permanent resident to become a citizen. And if you have five permanent residencies, you're having the clock tick towards becoming a citizen in five different places at the same time. And maybe some of them don't end up leading to citizenship or a passport due to different things, be it physical presence requirements or learning the language requirements, whatever it is. But you know, if you can get three out of five, that's not bad, right? Not at all. <laughs> and so I think uh, you know, this is a, a big sort of shift uh, that, uh, that people need to make in their minds where you don't just need to commit to getting one new residency or thinking that you have to live there, um, but realize that you can just basically go around and collect different residency permits and basically set up plan Bs. And uh, it's it's really just quite an adventure. It's very intellectually interesting, interesting and it opens up uh, a lot of different questions and opportunities and a different way to think about life. 100%. And the thing that you touched on there, some people, they just, they just don't their eyes glaze over. It doesn't necessarily have to be that effortful. I mean, it just, if you take half a second and make a plan with someone who can help you, you can intelligently design your life to have, as you said, all these little, these little pots on the stove boiling away, ticking away while you're just living your life. It doesn't take any extra effort. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you, uh, if you were going to have a, a child, let's say, I don't plan on having kids anytime soon, but if I did, I would make sure that the, the child was born in Brazil. 
and that would open up the passport uh, for the child and then potentially myself uh, and my partner. I mean, just having these little bits of knowledge uh, in the back of your mind can help you to form some of these plans. It doesn't mean you have to go way out of your way to make them happen, but there's something to be said for intelligently designing your life to give you uh, as many options as you can. Yeah, it can be as simple as, uh, you know, paying a lawyer like 2000 bucks and one, one quick five, 10 day trip, boom, boom, get things set up on paper. And then you go back home. And it was basically just a vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you did something productive with your time. And uh, you basically set up like a different place to live. What, what's interesting is there's, you know, 193, 197 countries in the world. But technically, you're really only allowed to live in one or two countries, which is the country that you were born, and maybe New Zealand. <laughs> um, but but really, like, you, you can't just show up somewhere and start living there. Um, there. There's a process, and it's really not as immediate as you think it is, even if you get a job offer or something. And so uh, when you're getting these permanent residencies and stuff, you're really just getting the right to live in a new country. It's not the obligation, but you're just getting the right. So why not go from a world where you're literally only allowed to live in one country to a world where you're allowed to live in multiple countries? Something to be said for that, for sure. All right. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I'd love to catch up with you in a couple of months where we can take a, a deeper dive into some of the other topics uh, that we may have missed or that... Uh, or that may come up in the meantime. Guys, if you're interested in any of what we had to say, make sure you check out the links that I will leave in the description. Make sure you're following uh, My Latin Life on Twitter and get in touch with uh, Vance from My Latin Life in, if you need some help in organizing uh, your offshore adventures. Thanks for watching, guys, and I hope to uh, see you again in the next episode. Take care, everybody.